Welcome to Seven Discoveries. Addressing basic questions for those starting in their spiritual journeys. Is there a God? If he does exist, what is he like? Does he speak to us? Is the Bible the Word of God? What is the Bible all about? Who is the Anointed One? Is there true love? Is there true forgiveness? What is the good news? Today, we look at chapter 4, Discover Jesus. Discover Jesus. The core of Christianity centers on Jesus Christ. The Old Testament points expectantly to a coming Messiah. The New Testament is all about that Messiah, or Christ, named Jesus. Gandhi said, I tell the Hindus that their lives will be imperfect if they do not also study reverently the teaching of Jesus. Lord Byron said, If ever God was man or man was God, Jesus Christ was both. To discover Jesus is to discover what the whole Christian faith is about. Christianity is a love relationship with Jesus Christ. First of all, let's look at the existence of Jesus. A case could easily be made revealing Jesus Christ as the focal point of history. Many distinguished scholars have affirmed the historicity of Jesus. H.G. Wells, the famous writer and agnostic, writes concerning Jesus. Here was a man. This part of the tale could not have been invented. It is impossible to believe in Jesus Christ apart from his history. Writer Michael Green wrote, Once disproved the historicity of Jesus Christ, and Christianity will collapse like a pack of cards. To diminish the existence of Jesus to some myth, is to ignore centuries of scholarship and historical evidences that are before us. Let us then look at the birth of Jesus. Every Christmas, Christians around the world celebrate the birth of Jesus. What was so unique about the birth was that Jesus was born of a virgin, thus fulfilling the Old Testament prophecy that was written 700 years earlier by the prophet Isaiah, who wrote, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Around the same time, another prophet named Micah predicted the birthplace of the Messiah. He wrote, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. The virgin birth of Jesus was not a natural likelihood, but it was a supernatural possibility. If his birth was a normal birth, then Jesus would have been just another special human being. The fact that the Virgin Mary conceived via the Holy Spirit made him a very unique child. Even Joseph, who was at the time engaged to Mary, had a hard time accepting Mary's pregnancy as being supernatural. However, Joseph did respond positively when an angel told him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. The virgin birth made it possible for Jesus to be both God and man. It was the means through which God could supernaturally become man. Sometime, after Jesus was born, Magi, or wise men from the east, 
came to Jerusalem in search of the one born king of the Jews. The Magi in ancient times were known as kingmakers. Historically, no Persian could be king until they had mastered the scientific and religious disciplines of the Magi. The Magi's influence and power continued in Greek and Roman empires, where we encountered this one sect with strong Jewish influence. When Jesus was born, the Magi came and worshipped him as king. After the visit of the Magi, Joseph took Jesus and his family to Egypt to flee from the evils of King Herod. The family eventually settled in Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. Other than the one occasion, at age 12, when Jesus amazed everyone in the temple courts in Jerusalem with his understanding and debated with the wise men of the day, Jesus lived in obscurity for some 30 years. The next time we hear about Jesus is when he began his public ministry. John the Baptist introduced Jesus to the public when he baptized him. Afterward, the Spirit led Jesus into the desert where he was tempted by the devil. After 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus went through Galilee preaching the message of the kingdom and healing the sick. His first of many miracles was performed at a wedding in Cana where he turned water into wine. Jesus cleansed the temple of God in his first recorded visit to Jerusalem after the start of his public ministry. It was at that time he interacted with a variety of people from a religious leader like Nicodemus to the lowly in society like the Samaritan woman. Jesus was open and accepting of all people, no matter who they were in society. He was severely criticized for socializing with sinners and those who were seen as the bottom feeders of society. Much of Jesus' ministry was in Galilee. He used Capernaum as his home base. The ministry of Jesus included many miracles by which the blind received sight, the lame walked, those with leprosy were cured, the deaf heard, and the dead were raised. Jesus also preached the good news to the poor and taught great truths through many parables. At the same time, Jesus spent his three years mentoring twelve disciples who would all desert him in his time of need. Jesus eventually traveled to Jerusalem via Perea, ministering as he went. Three years of Jesus' ministry concluded with his final days in Jerusalem, beginning with his triumphal entry into the city on a donkey. It was an entry where crowds of people spread their cloaks and branches on the road to honor Jesus as their king. Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah, who had written some 500 years earlier. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. After Jesus' dramatic entrance, into Jerusalem. It was recorded that he again entered the temple and cleansed it. He continued to teach his disciples while being challenged by the religious leaders of the day. Later that week, Jesus and his disciples observed the Jewish Passover, known today as the Last Supper. It was at this feast that Jesus took the bread and the cup and told his disciples of his coming death and the one who would betray him. After praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was arrested and taken away. Jesus was taken and tried before religious and political leaders. He was unfairly condemned to death, being guilty of nothing. 
Jesus was crucified on the cross and died an innocent man. However, his death was significant because of his holy life. John the Baptist understood that Jesus was the kind of sacrifice for the sins of mankind when he pointed to Jesus and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus' life was full of acts of kindness, love, mercy, and grace. His selfless teachings astounded scholars, pierced the hearts of hypocrites, and comforted the humble. Jesus not only changed the face of history, he was and is history. His life made an impact that has eternal consequences. Will Durant, an agnostic and former professor at Columbia University, wrote concerning Jesus, that a few simple men should in one generation have invented so powerful and appealing a personality, so lofty an ethic, and so inspiring a vision of human brotherhood would be a miracle far more incredible than any recorded in the Gospels. The holy life of Jesus should not have resulted in his death as a common criminal. However, Jesus' death on the cross was the most recorded and analyzed death in history. Those who were closest to Jesus did not hesitate to point out that he was sinless. John wrote, and in him is no sin. Peter quoted Isaiah in reference to Christ, saying, He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. Even the enemies of Christ admitted his perfection in life. Judas, who betrayed Jesus, was filled with remorse, saying, I have sinned, for I have betrayed innocent blood. A statement from some of those who were responsible for Jesus' death testified, Surely he was the Son of God. To admit that Jesus was the Son of God was to admit that he was as sinless as God was. Even Pilate admitted that Jesus was an innocent man who did not deserve to die. After Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, he stood for trial six separate times. The first trial was before Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, and it took place immediately after the arrest of Jesus. This trial was illegal, taking place at night, contrary to Jewish law. There were no indictments prepared, no witnesses heard, and no counsel was provided for the defendant. The officials physically abused Jesus when they disagreed with his responses to the questions he was given. Jesus was then immediately brought before Caiaphas, who also tried him. False witnesses were produced at this trial, and Jesus was convicted after he affirmed that he was indeed the Christ. It was recorded that at this trial the religious leaders spat in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? The third trial was held in the morning at which Jesus was convicted of blasphemy for claiming to be the Son of God. He was then sent to the Roman governor, Pilate, where Jesus was accused of perverting the nation by opposing payment of taxes to Caesar and claiming to be the king of the Jews. The fourth trial before Pilate was brief. Since Pilate learned that Jesus was from Galilee and was therefore under Herod's jurisdiction, Pilate sent Jesus to Herod, who happened to be in Jerusalem at the time. It was at this trial that Jesus was mocked and ridiculed by Herod and his soldiers before being returned to Pilate. The final trial before Pilate was a travesty of justice. Pilate tried to acquit Jesus and offered to scourge and release him. However, the chief priests and their officials wanted Jesus crucified. Pilate offered them a choice. 
to free Jesus or a known rebel and murderer named Barabbas. They chose to crucify Jesus and release Barabbas. Pilate eventually pronounced a death sentence on Jesus according to the will of the people. It was at this trial that Pilate had Jesus flogged, a beating so severe that it would have left a typical person barely alive. The soldiers also gave Jesus a crown of thorns, pressed down mockingly into his brow. Jesus had to carry his own cross until he was too weak from the beating to bear it any further. Simon of Cyrene was there and took over for Jesus in carrying the cross to Golgotha, meaning the place of the skull. It was on that hill where Jesus was crucified with two other criminals. Jesus was nailed to the cross he had earlier carried. An inscription was written and fastened on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. As Jesus hung on the cross at the peak of the day, darkness came over all the land. When he gave up his spirit, the curtain of the temple was torn into two from top to bottom, and the earth shook. Jesus lived like no one ever lived, and died like no one has ever died. Why was it necessary for Jesus to die? Why did he have to die to become our savior? In Greek mythology, when Paris abducted Helen of Troy, Agamemnon was put at the head of the expedition to Troy to take back his brother's wife. When the Greek fleet set sail from Aulis, they encountered no winds. They discovered that the reason for the lack of wind was that the goddess Artemis was angry with them for the lack of respect that they had shown her. Artemis demanded that Agamemnon sacrifice his daughter, Iphigenia, in order to appease her wrath. When Agamemnon finally sacrificed his daughter, the wrath of Artemis was appeased, and Agamemnon was allowed to set sail to Troy. Our God is so holy that his reaction to any sin is wrath. Old Testament priests often offer sacrifices to appease or atone for sins. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Some suggested that God could have just snapped his fingers and the world would be all right. Although God has the power to do so, it is not within his nature to do so. His holy nature would never compromise with sin. His holy nature requires him to react and deal with sin in a godly manner. The death of Christ was God's sacrifice for our sins. Instead of man making sacrifices to appease his wrath, God made the sacrifice for man. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. The death of Jesus satisfied the wrath of God. The penalty was severe. It shows us how serious God views sin. It also shows us how much God loves us in responding to sin in the way that he did. The Bible says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, why we were still sinners. Christ died for us. At the core of the message of Christianity is that Jesus died for our sins. To understand this concept is to understand the concept of debt. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our sins put us in great debt before our Heavenly Father. We deserve death as a result of our sins. It is like a beggar owing a king billions of dollars with no way of repaying it. But the king of this story sacrifices his own son in order 
to pay the beggar's debt. The king not only forgives the debt, but he gives the beggars millions of dollars in exchange. The beggar no longer lives as a beggar, but as a rich man. When we were in the debt of sin, the Father saw us as sinners, each one of us deserving of death. However, Jesus died for our sins and took our punishment. The Bible says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus died as our substitute. He died in our place. Peter wrote, For Christ died for our sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. When we believe that Jesus died for our sins, we receive him as we receive any gift. The Bible says, Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The Father no longer sees us as sinners, but as his children with the righteousness of Christ. The scripture says, For just as through the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man the many will be made righteous. The other core message of Christianity is that Jesus rose from the dead. After Jesus died, his body was taken and buried in a tomb owned by Joseph of Arimathea. With so many rumors of Jesus' disciples attempting to steal the body of Jesus, and the Pharisees persuaded Pilate to have the tomb sealed and watched by the Roman guards, this was recorded to show that Jesus did miraculously rise from the dead in the midst of great opposition. It was on that Sunday morning when Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, the mother of James, went to look at the tomb and found it empty. An angel would appear to them and proclaim, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. The women were overjoyed and quickly shared the news with the disciples. Eventually, Jesus appeared to his disciples in the flesh, visiting them several times, teaching and comforting them. He stayed 40 days on the earth after the resurrection before ascending into heaven. How certain can we be about the resurrection of Jesus? The scholar James Edwin Orr wrote, No single example can be produced of belief in the resurrection of a historical personage such as Jesus was, none at least on which anything was ever founded. The Christian resurrection is thus a fact without historical analogy. The evidence for the resurrection is too overwhelming to ignore. First of all, there's the reality of the church. The Christian church started in AD 32 in Jerusalem. The disciples of Jesus were mostly hiding, afraid, and feared for their lives after the death of Christ. What made these cowardly disciples stand boldly before the people of Jerusalem only weeks later and preach messages that would turn the world upside down? It was the fact that Jesus rose from the dead that changed their hearts and attitudes, giving them the boldness to proclaim the truth. The disciples started 
what is now known as the Church. The existence of the Church today gives evidence that Jesus did rise from the dead. A second evidence that Jesus did rise from the dead was the reality of Sunday. The first day of the week is Sunday. And Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week, according to Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. Christians in the early church met on the first day of the week, according to Acts chapter 20, verse 7. What changed the large Jewish population from worshipping on the Sabbath to worshipping on a Sunday? The fact that many churches today worship on Sunday gives evidence that Jesus did rise from the dead on the first day of the week. A third evidence is the reality of witnesses. There were many witnesses who saw Jesus after his death. All the gospel writers and disciples were witnesses to his resurrection. Paul tells us that there was a time when over 500 people saw Jesus at once. This eliminates any possibilities of some kind of hallucination could explain it. The most credible witness was Thomas, who doubted Jesus rose from the dead. When Jesus did appear to Thomas, he asked Thomas to touch his hands where the nails had been and to touch his side where he had been pierced by a spear. And Thomas said to Jesus, My Lord and my God. And Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. A fourth evidence that Jesus rose from the dead is the empty tomb. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, where was his body? The skeptics have suggested that the women went to the wrong tomb. If the women went to the wrong tomb, though it would be very easy for the enemies of Jesus to point out the right tomb, the fact that the chief priests tried to bribe the Roman guards to lie about the body being stolen meant that the women did go to the right tomb. The possibility that the disciples stole the body is inconsistent with their lives. The disciples were cowards who ran away from the first sign of trouble. Even if they attempted to steal the body, it would have been difficult for them to get by the Roman guards and remove the sealed stone. Eventually, every one of the disciples died convinced that Jesus rose from the dead. If they did steal the body, not many of them would die for a lie. Jesus did come out of the tomb supernaturally, not naturally. A fifth evidence is the reality of the written word. All of the New Testament writers viewed the resurrection as an accepted event. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all recorded the resurrection as a historical fact. Peter told the crowd in Jerusalem that God had raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. The Apostle Paul wrote, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Since all the writers affirm the resurrection of Jesus, this becomes another pillar of evidence to support the fact that Jesus did rise from the dead. A sixth evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is the reality of a Christian experience. The resurrection of Christ means that Jesus is alive and active today. He's not merely limited to the pages of history. He changes the lives of those who follow him today. He still helps drunkards to sober up, thieves to steal no more, those who hate to develop a heart of love, and those in darkness to be full of light. Jesus is alive. How he is changing people today is evident that he is risen. The resurrection of Christ gives believers many assurances in their faith journey. 
The first assurance is that we worship a living God. Our deity is not some lifeless idol, but alive and involved in our lives. Many other religious leaders lived and died, but Jesus lived, died, and rose again. The second assurance is that we know that there is life after death. Jesus proved it with his resurrection. The third assurance is that we know that there is a resurrection. Jesus said, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. Jesus predicted and proved that there is a resurrection. The fourth assurance that we have from the resurrection of Christ is that we know that Jesus is who he claims to be. His resurrection gives credibility to his claims. The fifth assurance that we have from the resurrection of Jesus is that we know there will be a judgment. Scripture is serious when it says, just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. The sixth assurance that we have in the resurrection is that our faith is useful. And if Christ had not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. So when we look at the life of Christ, his death, his resurrection, this makes him very unique. However, it is his unique claims that bears our attention. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. That was a claim to deity. The term Son of in the Jewish mind did not imply subordination, but equality and identity of nature. Son of God is the highest title of deity that only God could possess. Jesus claimed to be able to forgive sins. He said, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus also claimed to be the one who judges the world. He said, and he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Only God can judge the world. And Jesus claimed to give eternal life. He said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life is something only God can give. Jesus claimed to be sinless. He said, Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? Only the holy God is sinless. Jesus claimed to be the Savior from sins. He said, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be. You will indeed die in your sins. Jesus also claimed to be able to answer prayers. He said, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. Only the Sovereign Lord can answer prayers. Jesus claimed to be the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus also claimed to have all authority. He said to his disciples before he ascended into heaven, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He claimed to be the one in essence with God. He said, I and the Father are one. The Jews knew exactly what Jesus meant when he said these things and wanted to stone him. When Jesus asked his critics for which miracle he had performed that they were planning to stone him for, the Jews replied, We are not stoning you for any of these, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. All the claims that Jesus made on earth were references to deity. The conclusion is that Jesus was either a liar 
a lunatic, a legend, or he was who he claimed to be, the Son of God. It would be almost impossible for Jesus to have lied because it was inconsistent with his holy life and teachings. Jesus could have been a lunatic. However, again, the impact of the life and teachings of Jesus does not fit the persona of him being a madman. The possibility that Jesus never made these claims and that his followers were just creating the idea that he was God, making him a legend, ignores many scholarly principles. The conclusion is that he must be, as he claimed to be, God in human form. He is truly Lord. Jesus not only existed in the writings of our history books, but he also exists in the media today. He told his disciples that he would be going away from them for a little while and would one day return. He said to them, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Jesus promised his disciples that they would not be alone on this earth. The Holy Spirit will come and be with them and live in them. He said, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Christians today have the Spirit of Christ dwelling in them. The New Testament speaks mystically of the Spirit living in us. The Apostle Paul wrote, You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. Yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit. Who lives in you. Another perspective of a believer's relationship to Christ is that Christians are the ones who are quote unquote in Christ. Paul addressed the believers in Colossae as the holy and faithful brothers in Christ. He also addressed the Philippian Christians as saints in Christ Jesus. The language of Christ living in a believer, in a believer being in Christ, speaks of the intimate relationship we are to have with Jesus Christ. Jesus is alive today, and he wants to be with us and in us. We need to acknowledge his spirit and his presence until he physically and bodily returns one day. Here are some questions to ponder. What about Jesus catches your attention. What does quote unquote Jesus died for your sins mean to you? Why is the resurrection of Jesus Christ relevant to you today? What amazes you about the claims of Jesus? Is the presence of Jesus a reality in your life? May God bless you in your spiritual journey.